my name is Nikolai, and I'm an editor, colorist, director, whatever, from Russia. Uh, red Evangelist uh, was one of the first ones who brought the red into Russia, and since then been kind of forcing people to shoot red. And Final Cut X is kind of a similar thing, where you're like, look, Final Cut X is great, let's do that, and everyone, no, let's do edit, and I'm like, no, let's do Final Cut X, and so kind of, it's my hobby to introduce things to the Russian market that kind of blows everyone's brains off, and they kind of scared of. And so here it's, uh, it's one of those things. So we, um, we shot a TV series, a 16-part original, bit of Twin peaks kind of drama, uh, pretty new for Russia because most of the content in Russia is based on either remakes from US shows or bought uh, rights from comedy shows from Israel or whatever, and they just rehash it and it's pretty all boring. And here someone actually decided to uh, put their own money, invest into a show, and they shot it on like Weapon 6K, anamorphic lenses, uh, all beautifully, this beautiful done and on all, but Twin Peaks since now the producers are going like, well, let's all make it less arty, come on, please make it a bit more commercial because we can't sell it otherwise. But that's not the point. The point is that, uh, so my topic is said like editing the show with red and anamorphic. Now that topic isn't really that interesting because it's actually no difference to editing red and anamorphic to any other. So we skip that part. Uh, and I'll show you some of the workflows that we've been doing. Now, the interesting thing is, like the DCMC2 cameras from RED, they record simultaneously raw files and proxy files in the same streams. So it's really easy to start editing. You pretty much get your cards, you get your offloads, and you've got your progress files already. So what we've done, we've, we archive the R3D files, the raw files, onto an archive system, and we never see them until the color grading, and don't touch them, they lie somewhere there. And in the online edit, I use the ProRes that I created in the camera. Uh, so here, for example, that would, would look like that. So your files, ProRes generated in the camera. Uh, so with the proper, proper aspect ratio, so there's nothing special about it, you edit them as, as normal files. And you get your audios, or your audio on a separate, obviously, separate files. Uh, there is some scratch audio because the camera's got built-in mics, and sometimes we put external recorders onto the camera. But that's not always the case. You not always get the scratch audio on the files, and that's important for the later part. Because sometimes you record slow mos and then the camera obviously doesn't record audio. Uh, we relink the whole thing, usually pretty much the same thing as everyone does, hopefully. If you don't do that, you should. So we export an XML uh, for sync and link. Um, uh, it's sync and link is not properly installed here, but it doesn't matter, probably will work. So we, we use sync and link for to merge. And everyone familiar with sync and link, right? No. Almost, no? It's basically a little app that's really great because it merges, uh, it merges your audio and video files and takes all the metadata from the audio, which I can show it to you, so if I'll be sometimes randomly clicking left and right. So the audio files have actually take names, scene names, and things like that embedded into it. So when you merge them with your video files with sync and link, at the end you receive something like that, where you've got your audio files in the synchronized clips, and if we open up the information window, you can actually see that those files, let's go extend it, have information about, about take, shot, and file name. And the cool thing is actually, with the press of one button, we can rename them, and that will add into the, into the files. So you, after that, you can sort it, and, and you see exactly which, which series it belongs to, which take it comes from. And I like to keep the original file names in the back of it as well. So this is like the basic part of and Sync and Link works like that. I'll show it to you while so you, so you actually look at it and see that it's true. It works like that, and it's not just my imagination. So you go export, XML. Where did I save it? I save it onto the desktop. Perfect. You go Sync and Link. Open the XML that I just saved. It says that it found six video clips, six audio clips. Name, you can uh, merge the name from the audio clip and the video clip, but I prefer to keep actually the original video name here and then add the names from the metadata. Take the metadata from audio and video and merge it back into the audio file. Uh, take the names, the sub roles, like some 
there's a lot of information in the audio file. So the audio guy who sits there on the set, he actually records it all and logs it all. So it's all there, so it's silly not to use it because quite a, quite a, many loggers actually then spend days renaming all the files, like take one, take two, take three, things, blah, 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 blah. This can all be done automatically. So you say sync link, save, uh, yeah. I usually call it synced, so I know what it is, and input back into the project. And here you get your synced files with all the metadata in them. Uh, here you can, there are two versions I, I didn't, usually I prefer that it actually cuts off the, the black parts and just syncs it uh, to the exact direction of the video. For that I probably should have, uh, you, there's a little, uh, where is it? There is a trip climps. That's I prefer this one, so I redo it. Because that way, you actually your video actually will be exactly the same. Oh, well, didn't name it. It's okay. So this way now, it's the video is exactly the same length as, uh, as and the important the unimportant audio parts were cut off. So if you actually enter any of the clips, you see that the audio is potentially longer. It goes there to the. Left. See, see, there are little bits of audio there, but we don't need it because usually it's, yeah, it's there. If there's a sync issue, like here, we can see that it's actually clappable here, but the time could drift it a little bit. So you can, you know, adjust it by a little bit or whatever, by how much you need it. So you just adjust it, and because it's a synchronized clip, it will in there. Now, get back to the sync that I want to sync. So here we've got our sync files. So we rename them. Synchronize files, rename, custom name, all, all, all of them. So, and here starts the interesting part. Late, I like to use redistributed editing with dailies because I don't want to sit in a studio. I like to edit, you know, whenever I travel, I take a laptop with me. Or I've got several editors around, like spread over Russia, who I like to give the footage to them, send it over to them, they edit and get it back to me. Now, we don't have a problem if everyone has the same footage. I've got my progress files and I've got my sound files. There's no problem. Just send in an XML, they import it back into Final Cut, edit it, and it's all great. But what, you know, but that requires like terabytes of data to be sent back and forth, and it's a bit frustrating. So what I decided, like, let's make proxies. Let's make tiny proxies like H.264 files and edit them. So for that, we could, try to use, first I thought, let's use Final Cut to render batch proxies, but that doesn't work. Because if you use like Frame.io, for example, it can render s individual files, but it doesn't actually keep the time code. So you get the same names, but you don't get the time code. If you use primary exporter, the same thing, keeps the file names, but doesn't keep the time code. So the first thing that we come up with is how to actually render dailies uh, into H.264 and keep the time code. So for that, we use, um, uh, we use, we use DaVinci. It's actually a funny thing that DaVinci can be used most of the time to fix gaps in Final Cut development. So if Final Cut missing something, use the free version of DaVinci to fill in the gaps. <laughs> <laughs> It, da Vinci doesn't work for editing, but it's great to like little cheats. I'll tell you more about it. So here I've got my, um, all my dailies on, on one timeline. So export it into Da Vinci. So here we just simply import the dailies. There we go. So here we go to deliver. And here we've got individual files, but if you just say individual files, here we'll go to H.264 as our codec. We can't use the MPEG, MPEG-4 because MPEG-4 doesn't transcode time code, so if, like, for everyone to know, so that's why we use QuickTime as a container and H.264 as a codec. Another beauty of using a DaVinci is that I can restrict actually the bitrate to something small, and you can't do that from Final Cut. Uh, you're stuck with their presets, so you can actually get smaller proxy files. Now, a little trick from here file, you go source name, and you think that everything is great, it will keep actually the same source names, but it doesn't. Uh, it only keeps the same source names if you didn't rename your compound clips. The second you rename your compound clips of Final Cut, or change anything to the compound clips, it will rename all the files one, two, three, four, five, six. So the way to do it is, is to get custom name 
and press the little percentage sign and tell them file name. And that way, it will actually grab the file name from exactly what you've been using rather than something from the head. And that when you render it, you end up with, yeah, I already pre-rendered them so we don't have to actually wait for the, uh, so you end up with files like that coming from it. You know, and they don't weigh anything. So it's like 25 megabytes, 30 megabytes per take. And those are the files that we use for actually for dailies and for like upload and frame IO. And then my remote editor can download them back, edit them because they've got the same file names, they've got the same time code, and they've got everything, but they don't weigh anything. I actually did several things. I edited them on an iPad because you know, I didn't want to carry out a MacBook, so I just downloaded all those files. It was like you know, 500 megabytes, a couple gigabytes, you're on an iPad, edit on an iPad, export an XML. And then we have a question, how do we bring it back? Because after the edit is done, he sent back an XML. And here comes slightly tricky parts. So here's our edit, uh, link to all proxy files, for example, you know, whatever, just like some random shots that I've got. The problem is here, it's linked to proxy files, but I need it linked to my compound clips that contain all the sound information. See, the compound clips have all the multi-tracks from the audio that I can be using and controlling. So, and this is the audio that the final editor uh, or the, we need to send to the sound guys at the end so they can do the sound mix. But from the remote editor, I get back just the embedded audio with nothing into it. So the question is, how do I reattach that to that? Uh, no one is doing that workflow, so it's, this part's gonna be looking a little bit like a technological demo. <laughs> it is possible to do, it's still a little bit ugly, but repeatable. So what we do, again, we use DaVinci. So we export our edit. We call it, you know, edit back, just so we know what it, what it is. So we import it into that, let's create a new master folder. We import our edit. Here it doesn't really matter if he found clips or no, because you know, we want to actually relink them to the compound clips. So here we've got our edit. So now DaVinci is a bit funny. If I just tell DaVinci to relink those clips, it won't relink them to the compound clips, because it will find the time code and the file names in the original movie files, and it will relink them to the movie files. And then it does, it, we're again stuck with, you know, with stupid files. But here we've got actually our compound clips. And the bizarre thing is, that's the only thing that you have to do manually. You have actually to select all your compound clips and get them into a separate bin. Because then you can tell DaVinci to automatically uh, match from a bin, just a bin, and it matched them to the compound clips. But if the compound clips will be in the same folder with the original footage, it won't do that. Why? I don't know. Now, we think that everything is perfect, and we can just export it back as an XML uh, and import it back into Final Cut. And it's almost like that. So we do that. Where is our uh, Final Cut? So import, XML, edit back resolve. Seems that everything is fine. See, we have our compound clips, the edit is back, and it's now relinked to like the original uh, online media that we use. So we can then, the only issue is, and I think it's a bug as in Resolve on the XML, take a look at what we've got with our sound. Sound isn't back. The compound clips are back, but the sound isn't. So it actually does not relink properly back to the original uh, multi-track WAF files. Luckily, there's a reasonably easy fix to that. Now, because uh, compound, you know, the difference between synchronized clips and compound clips is that synchronized clips uh, don't, don't uh, link back to the parent clips, but compound clips actually link back to the parent clips. So if you change the parent clip, the compound clips will change the entire edit. Mm -hmm. And so the, the thing that you do is basically, I'm almost over, is you create a, a new library. Why do I create a new library? Because if I actually take now my edit, and import it into a new library, it will show me all the compound clips that I'm using in the edit. 
and I don't have to manually change them all. And so the, the last thing that you do is actually you enter the, open the compound clip, and here you replace the, your, audio, your files with, with the properly synchronized ones that you've got. I know it's, uh, it seems like a big thing to do, but it's actually quite, quite fast. So you can take like one of those files and replace it. Uh, and then when you back in your edit in your line here, now if I dissolve the compound clip here, uh, which one did I replace? I replaced this one, I think, here. Yeah? Wait, let me just double check which I replaced, actually. So I can actually demonstrate it. So we replace this one, we replace with, with this one. And we kill all the stupid sound because we don't need that. And then we go back to our edit and we and we've got our proper synchronized clip with all our sound here. And so this way, like with a little of hand manual use, you can actually do this workflow. You can actually send like hundred megabytes of files to your remote editor and get it all back. Uh, and the task it seems like complicated because you have to manually relink it, but actually it takes you know, a tenth of a real time, like a tenth of a project. So like for, an, for a feature film, you can do it in like 10 to 20 minutes to relink it all back and forth. So it's actually not, uh, it's, it's not that complicated. Uh, now in the same workflow, you can use for something, uh, something bizarre, like for example, transfer multicam from Edit to Final Cut, which is impossible, except if you use something like that. What you do first is in Edit, you dissolve your multicams and it stays in the, in the timeline of single camera ones. Then you import them into, res into Resolve, uh, and, then import an and then import Final Cut multicams into Resolve, and they're forced to link one to another and then get them back to Final Cut. And then suddenly Final Cut's got multicams instead of uh, standard edit. It's a way how to uh, actually do small dailies remote editing in Final Cut uh, and DaVinci Resolve. There you go.